Carlos, who is sitting right in front and who was a student at the DRL and graduated in 2000 and has been working um, around us for a while and has come back to do a, a PhD, by the way, and he's put together this inter very interesting lecture series and we at the, of the DRL, and I'm teaching there as you might know, have been doing similar kind of uh, lecture series over a number of years which look at related fields, creatives and professionals who are also kind of have to deal with this new onslaught of new media and this new condition which we might call cross-platforming which shows up that architects and a whole series of other fields in the, in, 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 in the uh, uh, creative uh, domain are dealing with these new tools and trying to see how this pushes their field forward and I think it's of course although we all look at uh, uh, stuff like this uh, on the web uh, in various galleries and museum conditions it, would be, it is a, very, a different thing to invite somebody over and hear what they have to say, how they think about their projects, how they, what ambitions they have and what is the underlying th thought processes and, and ambitions. So I'm very glad to introduce uh, Simon Sankoraya, who is the art director and founding member of Digit London, uh, and a, a company who is, which is interesting which in the respect that it's not only kind of in the domain of uh, commercial application, but at the same time oscillating back and forth between this domain of business and the domain of research projects, uh, which are based mainly kind of located in the in the art domain and using kind of uh, institutions like the ICA, the New Media Lab, etc., as as a kind of forum and 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 outlet to experiment with it, with the new media. And particularly interesting for us, kind of uh, the the uh, exploration of modes of interactivity. As you know, at the DRL, we're working at the moment with seeing how architecture can get involved itself with in kind of a new augmented environments, responsive environments, which also uh, means that we have to understand and think about. Uh, um, interaction and, and, and um, designed environments which, which, which respond and interact with, with, with users. So, um, anyway, I uh, please let's welcome Simon and uh, see what he has to say. Thank you. Um, <coughs> as, as per usual, <laughs> as per usual, um, technology has failed to a certain extent this evening. Um, my computer as fast as it is, is running about 5% of what it should be. So hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, theoretically, you've come to hear about my creative genius, which I'm not sure about that, but um, we'll, we'll find out maybe later on about that. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, Dalgit, who was supposed to be here, has been tied up at work, so I'm the, uh, I'm the plan B. And um, my, um, my, my position at... Uh, Um, my position at the studio is as the, uh, the art director. I've been working there um, at the studio for um, six and a half years. Um, we set the company up in, in Nottingham, um, which uh, Dalgit set up. He was head of interactive design at, um, at IBM at the time. And he was, to a certain extent, sort of um, frustrated with working in a very big corporate environment. He, um, he ended up um, basically leaving um, with enough money to set up a small company, as we were then, um, which, um, being in a corporate environment, he decided that what he wanted to do is spend some of his time doing corporate work and some of his time doing work for himself. Um, and what we decided from, from the inset is that we would do work for ourselves and we would do work for clients. Um, which has all completely manifested itself in what we do today. We spend about 20% of our own time doing work for ourselves, um, which is now kind of fueled into sometimes the work we do for ourselves, clients ask for, um, sometimes the work that we do for clients, um, we come across ideas as we're doing them that um, end up in pieces for ourselves. Um, but we always try and keep that, that balance of doing things for yourself and um, the, the, the rationale of why I think that's important is, is I'll probably mention quite a few times, but to me, I, I guess a couple of things why it's important to continually look at doing work for yourself is um, that it gives you um, the reason to go and learn new 
pieces of software or find about new kind of different pieces of, of, uh, of technology or different areas of design you don't really necessarily have any expertise in. Um, but we've always had this kind of, um, this ideal that um, rather than write a white paper and, do, and, and go into research, it's far easier for us, um, for where we stand, to just go ahead and try and do it. Um, it's a very press tax kind of approach. It's, you could say it's a bit stupid because um, you go misinformed into something, but you know, there's the classic adage that um, you know, it's very hard to go back to the innocence of your childhood and look at things through their eyes. So I think, in a certain degree, there's quite a good, um, a good sense of uh, stupidity gives you um, good, uh, brings some good ideas out. I, my talk is, is usually called, what am I doing? Because half the time we, we aren't really sure what we're doing, but we're quite sure that we're doing something that's vaguely interesting quite a lot of the time. Um, all the stuff here is, is, is basically um, rubbish. This is all the stuff that we um, are, is for websites or just um, stuff that clients don't like, stuff that we've done for ourselves, sketches, bits and bobs, but it's because I come from mainly a, a graphic, a, formerly a graphic design and an informational design background. Um, I come from things graphically rather than from a programming sense. Um, I've learned how to program. Um, the, program <coughs> the programmers in the studio would probably tend to disagree with the fact that I'm a programmer, um, I'm sure. But um, somewhere along the line, I can, I can get by. But um, I think the, one of the really important things is to, is to understand it, um, to have a good balance between um, good creative visual work and good creative back end or, or programming or, or technical or electronic work. Because once you find a balance with people you can work with, then you've really got something um, you should hold on to. Um, in the studio, one thing that we really do have definitely is a great balance between um, someone who's maybe formerly a graphic designer, but they may well be the sound guy for the studio. That's definitely the case in our case. The guy who does most of our sound, trained um, as a graphic designer and a fine artist, and he does nothing but sound design now. Um, me and myself, I do a bit of everything. Um, the guy's head of sort of technology is um, a fine artist himself. The reason he really loved um, he really loved programming and 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 sort of director specifically is because he really loved animation. But what he actually found with the director is that you can actually control animation, and the control of something is definitely something that um, I think is, is is what really attracts you to interactive design after a while, because you can actually affect something, be involved in it, be engaged in it, be part of it meet someone else within it. Um, and there's very few mediums you can, I think you can do that um, at all. And again, it's just the sense of kind of being in, a bit in the dark all the time really helps you feel like um, you're going to discover something all the time. Um, so I'll switch off this. And okay, one of, um, one of the first bits of work that we did for God, this is, sorry about this you can this thing is actually supposed to be moving very fast <laughs> if you can imagine that um, so okay let's go um, about I guess about five years ago we were looking at um, really simple things about um, of ideas of interaction um, and what we uh, what we came up with was this really, really simple piece of work, which we thought was absolute rocket science at the time, which was um, obviously you move, you move left and right. Okay, let's get some sound. Uh, you move up and down, up and right, left and left and right, up and down, and the squares move depending on which way you've come from it. Um, I mean, to be quite honest, five. Five years ago, this this really was like the pinnacle. We thought we cracked it. We didn't, weren't sure what it was, but um, we were sure that we were on something. Um, but the reason I always show this is, it, 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 to me, it really exemplifies something that, that I think is really important um, with quite a lot of the work that we do, because um, it's about simplicity. Um, you can you can sit and you can play with this thing for for ages. And the other thing I love about it is that it might be from a digital medium or it, it's a digital thing, but it's quite relaxing. Um, and to me, it's um, digital doesn't seems to mean to a lot of people that it's in your face and it's shouting at you and it's selling you this and it's it's kind of doing 300 different things at once. 
Um, and I tend to sit on the sense of, well, I'd rather it, people felt like it didn't do much of anything, but some people really engaged with it. Um, and to me, this is really good. It, it suggests quite a lot of what, um, of what I think is good about, about good interactive design, which is about simplicity. Um, and just the fact that, you know, just the addition that sound makes on it, just the fact that as soon as you go down, it's, um, it gets slightly deeper. So that's... Um, every client we've ever showed that to wants to put their logo on the squares, by the way. And we tell them that we can't. We've still never done it so far, so at least we stick to our guns to a certain degree. Um, I'm going to show... Uh, um, part of what we've done over um, the last few years is do two CD-ROMs for ourselves. Um, these were done... <laughs> specifically for the fact that clients wouldn't let us do at all what we wanted. Um, the first one we did was called Balls, which was literally a working title because it was a set of balls that flew around um, that were basically different sections within, within the CD-ROM. But it was the whole idea of um, trying to bring some sort of space within the screen. Um, we kept with the idea of the, the idea of space within the screen. It's definitely something that we're interested in. You have obviously the, this huge initial problem with screen-based work that um, with space, obviously, you have a depth. You have Z depth. And there's not really a logical way, if you're just using a mouse, to actually go into the screen, really. Um, I haven't really seen anything that does it well. Um, I'm sure there'll be someday when somebody comes up with a really brilliant way of moving into the screen. But at the minute, you've always got to have another way of doing it, whether it be key commands or you've got a slider to do this, which is what we did, which is obviously very simple. But um, the, 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 the subject of space within the screen, I think, is really quite interesting. Um, so this is something. This is what we did for ourselves. Um, we called it Sudden Drop. Um, Daljit saw um, a door on the tube, a tube station, that had um, a sign in it that said, um, said, beware Sudden Drop. And he said... Um, wouldn't it be interesting to think about what was on the other side of the door? So this was kind of an, an assembly of um, uh, what we thought was behind the door and a couple of people's dreams within the studio because we were working a bit too much at the time. Um, so really simply, what you've got is um, this tiny little control here. That, um, you've got these kind of objects floating by, and some of them are a bit larger than, than others. And the larger objects that float by um, are basically sections within, um, within the CD-ROM. So you can, you can kind of stop them with the slider, and if you kind of quite like the look of them, you can sort of click on them and uh, break them open or smash them open, so to speak. So some of them are interactive toys, some of them are kind of pieces of video. So um, I'll just show you this one, which is kind of another, again, very simple thing. We seem to have this thing about things in grids, which is a, kind of a, a bit of a trait that's stayed. Um, but again, very simple thing, it just feels... Um, all, it's, all it's doing is these dots are trying to find their, their quickest way back to the point that they were around a circle. Um, and we kind of looked at it and it was like, well, it's kind of interesting when there's one of them. And then, um, stupid as we were, we were like, well, what does it look like if there's 64 of them? Um, and it looks like this, which, um, again, I, it's something that um, it's really pleasing to use. It explains the sense that, that interactive media doesn't really have to be um, shouting at you to get you involved in it. Um, and it's also the fact of, of just your surroundings. I mean, when you're at school, the, um, the first thing your art teacher tells you is look out, look around you and look at the way trees, trees like where, the way leaves fall and the way that trees look and the way that grass feels and try to express that in your painting. Um, and it's just the same thing. You've just got to remember certain things that you've been told, I think, as you've been going along, because I think it's quite easy to get caught up in new technology and new ideas and the, the best new thing when um, quite a lot of the time, I think, quite a lot of the best ideas are, are kind of... They are surrounding you. They're, they're, they're all around us. So I think in that sense, there's, um, there's something always to be said from, from definitely looking back and, and also taking on what's, looking, what's, what's in front of us all. So um, if I just get out... I'll just show you one of the, the video things in here. Um, like, a, like any good interactive piece, this thing is random. So I'm going to have to wait till it actually comes through. Oh, okay. 
So hopefully it come back. Okay, so one of the um, what we did in the studio, one of the things we always do is um, with projects like this, um, everyone's involved, whether it be the girl who answers the phone to um, Dalje or me, when we've all got kind of um, a flat hierarchy, I think, when it comes to things like this. And the girl who at the time was, was answering the phone was obsessed about death. Um, and she, she, the last line in this sort of piece um, is something that she said. So we kind of built this around um, her sort of creative idea. So um, first of all, the kind of what we thought would be, be quite nice to have... Um, Okay. Um, we thought it'd be quite nice to have an interface that um, that worked. <laughs> Come on, it's I can hear it spinning. Okay. Okay. So it starts off with um, just a simple piece of video. It's actually a piece of tube with some material on that we ran around the studio with a torch at the end. It's not actually inside of something. Clear. So just at the end of the video, basically, just the last sentence comes out and you can just sort of drag it around, which again, you know, quite a few years ago we thought was, was quite clever in itself. But we just start, thought it would be quite nice to just at least have some boundary that, that between playing video and something that's interactive. So, if we get out of this. Um, okay, the payoff. Um, sometimes our clients actually uh, quite like what we do, um, and they say, "Oh, we've seen something that you that, that you did that was for yourselves, and um, can you kind of do that for us?" Um, and this happens very, very rarely. But um, one of the few times it did was when uh, we did some work with MTV. Um, this is a couple of years ago. Um, we, MTV came to us with um, a website that worked really well that was called MTV2. Um, MT I don't know if anybody knows, but I'll go over it really quickly. MTV2 is a, a website where, out of all of the MTV kind of sites, it's, it's probably the, the one that, that plays decent music or decent music videos. Um, uh, you don't have to sit there listening to Westlife all day or, or, or Britney Spears. Hopefully nobody is likes them in here, I've just offended them. Um, but you've got, you've got your kind of core good videos, you've got your Chris Cunningham videos, you've got your et cetera, et cetera. It's all sort of on there. And what the site did is it allowed users to um, program an hour of, of, of on air um, by choosing, I think it was 15 of their favorite videos, choosing kind of clocks to count down to them. So you got kind of a small amount of personalization. You could send them, send them your name, so it was Sankey's hour or whatever. Um, and then they, in their, uh, in their boardroom, decided, well, which ones that they were going to air, which I assume is going to be the most interesting choices. Um, so what they did is they came to us and said, well, come up with some ideas. Um, and what we thought was, well, what, what actually is MTV? What is this thing about? And we thought, well, it's, it can't look too, it can't look kind of too edgy or then, because the people who are actually looking at the videos know exactly what that is. So the audience can't really be kind of shouted at um, or shouted to. Um, it was definitely something about space and community um, due to the fact that the people on there were very much obviously into music, which is obviously everybody always has their kind of subcultures of, uh, of music and just through all the different genres of that. Everybody wants their own specific thing for that. Um, and obviously just building blocks or something to do with building because you're actually supposed to create your own hour on there. So that 
um, we had a couple of, um, I'll call them inspirations uh, for this, which is probably really just amounts to us uh, ripping things off. Um, one, obviously, is Mario, because um, gaming, I think, to, the, to their sort of target market was definitely um, something they'd be interested in. And just the simplicity of, 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 how, of how the game looked and felt um, was, was something that we felt was, was kind of would, would, would hit them quite well. Um, something that's familiar to people always works, seems to work incredibly well. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Um, if not, it's, if you can't see, it's, um, it's from Blade Runner. And it's just the, one of the shots of uh, just the city where the, um, one, the spaceship actually just moves really kind of dramatically up. And this whole idea about space and sort of futuristic cities um, was something that we definitely kind of uh, was influenced. And there's, there's pretty much um, a scene within the site that's almost exactly this shot, which um, I'll show you. But I think you've got, you, even though it's a website, you can think of them, um, you can think of things in the sense of um, taking influence from film or furniture or whatever. Um, there's always something that, um, I think that, that, helps you, that helps you think about it in a completely different way and gives it a bigger scale feeling if you think about it from that sense. So, so that's Blade Runner. Um, and uh, obviously because at the time we were 10 blokes in a room looking at computers, um, Star Wars got involved in there somewhere. Um, so obviously the opening bit of Star Wars where this kind of, where the, um, the Imperial cruiser um, flies over, we just thought that this, again, this is sort of, the, the drama of the shot and just the way that it, you know, it's, it's something that was totally from our, uh, our, our heritage and it was like part of our nostalgia. We thought we'd really love to get that involved because, again, we thought it was the target market. It was probably, you know, it was the right thing to do. So um, the site that we built um, is here. I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen this, so I'll, I'll go through um, not too much of it, but um, it, it, I think it's worth seeing. Hopefully you can see some of the references that I've talked about. But um, I, I don't usually like talking about awards, but we probably won the most awards out of anything, I think, for this site. We've won a BAFTA, we've won um, a Best of Show um, from Design Week, which actually beat the Millennium Eye, which is a bit ridiculous. Um, but um, it's, it's been incredibly successful. Um, so again, this is working very slowly, which I apologize for. Um, so, you've got your five different areas, um, which are obviously all pieces that, that fit together. Um, and they're basically just the different sections within the site. So, um, if I go... So basically every time you go into a different area of the site, um, the blocks start kind of breaking out a bit more, so you get to sort of... Um, you get to kind of investigate all the spaces and all the different shapes. It's a really, really simple, pure idea. Um, but it was quite interesting for us that we actually uh, made the whole thing um, in 3D Studio uh, and then exported it all and put it into Flash, which was at the time an incredibly labor-intensive um, process. But um, the other thing that it actually got us, I think, was, um, was a sense of craft in, in, in the site. Um, and I think we tended to see a lot of stuff that um, was 3D for the sake of it. And what we actually did was, because we had a rationale behind it, we thought it, and we'd actually spent the time actually going through every, literally every kind of frame of the animation, and we had to hand color the whole thing, um, that it gave it a sense of craft. So um, I think for that sense, it, it definitely got picked up by most other people, and definitely the users, wh of which um, I think they quadrupled in something like uh, three weeks or something. Um, and obviously MTV were happy because they had to do less programming um, of their own. Um, one thing that we did do in, um, in here, we put some sort of hidden things in it that um, the client didn't actually know anything about. Um, so there's uh, a game of Tetris in there. I think there's a game of Pong. There's, a, there's about three or four games in this little type sort of thing, um, which are just there for the, for the people who actually bother taking the time, actually investigating and searching around the thing. Um, Surprise is definitely always like a, uh, a huge asset to you, I think, in interactive design. And um, it's quite easy to do. I mean, randomness and um, people always talking about kind of, you know, the unexpected, the unexpected element and the dynamic element. Um, all quite fundamental, quite easy things to do. But 
if you actually put them in the right place or, or scatter them through what you're doing, um, you don't get that kind of thing where, with, with a lot of interactive design where you get to the front and it's incredible and then you go past that and nothing really seems to happen. Um, and I think making sure that there's, there's good, interesting steps along the way and it's quite level all the way through is, is I think is really important as well. So I'm just going to the, the last section of this. Well, this is basically the Blade Runner shot. Um, and I'll just go to all the little sections here. So, one thing that we did as well, which I'll, I'll show after this, is we did, because um, they were rebranding the whole thing, they, um, they asked us to pitch for the on-air graphics, all the clocks and um, the, uh, the different timers and, and, and all the, the sort of packaging for the, for the station. Um, we, got, we actually won the pitch, and um, what we did is some of the clocks, you could actually, we made them as sort of screensavers and things like that. So what you're actually seeing on air is stuff that you could have on your computer and vice versa. Um, and I think it was one of the first times we'd actually found a client that um, understood the idea of a synergy between um, on air, off air, um, print, whatever, whatever they were going to do. And they took the whole design and really ran with it and did quite a lot of other stuff with it, um, which... Um, was really successful, you know, it was really nice for us because we actually managed to design something that was pretty much the whole package. Um, and it, it strengthened the whole thing, I think, altogether because you never saw anything about MTV2 that looked any different. It was always kind of the same thing, but just with a slightly different twist, um, which I think was, um, was kind of really successful for us. So if, hopefully this will run okay, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is all the on-air. Um, idents that we did. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, I can see it, but you can't. <laughs> I could listen to it, but I'm sure that, um, that's not necessarily the most interesting. Actually, let me just see if I can play this. It's, it's worth seeing because uh, most people have never actually seen it, so... So, one thing that um, sometimes obviously happens is uh, our clients, um, oh look, it's magically not appeared. Okay, sorry. Um, obviously, some of the time, um, our clients don't believe us at all, and uh, this was a pitch that we did um, that, was, that was, as well, it was m as much us trying to learn something as um, hopefully seeing if the client will actually go for it as well. Um, this is a pitch that we didn't win at all, and we put loads of work in, and this is the accumulation of, re of pitching, re-pitching three times for something. Um, I think it's it, it's it's always quite important to um, to illustrate the fact that we spend loads of time doing stuff that quite a lot of the time never actually gets used at all. And something hopefully should appear in a minute. Okay. So um, we wanted to um, we kind of needed an excuse to to try a couple of things out in 3D Shockwave. Um, of which uh, this was this was kind of what um, what we did. Uh, this was for a, um, a new car for um, VW, which was called the D at the time when when they uh, they told us. Apparently, it's now called something else, and it's a completely different car. And this project actually was never going to happen in any case. So, I have no idea why they asked us to spend all our time doing it. But 
Um, that aside, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have sour grapes about the whole thing at all. Um, but we thought it'd be quite nice to have this this idea of um, kind of breaking out, breaking up the world of what the VW, what the car was about. Um, and I've, and um, there's this place called the Glass Factory, which is um, their main um, VW factory, which is which is in Germany. And um, the building's really amazing. It's, it's kind of a, it's this kind of huge glass sort of dome. Uh, where you can actually look in, and uh, I'm not sure if anybody actually would, but you can look in and actually basically see the whole, the whole sort of um, process of the car being sort of started from scratch to actually being made. Um, so we thought it'd be quite useful, it'd be quite a nice thing to actually um, involve the building and the car and just sort of split all the parts about and kind of travel through, um, travel through the car and the the factory sort of, kind of if they're in sort of unison if they're split together. Um, and we just thought, well, this was supposed to be as well. It was supposed to be aimed at kind of your, um, your sort of 40, 45-year-old businessman. So it had to be really easy to use. So what we thought would just be the best way to do it is just have yes and no questions. Um, so you've only got you know, left or right. Most people, I'm sure, can manage that. So it was just the idea that um, you kind of move through this path, which you can kind of jump. You can jump to different places within it, around. But you could also go through it in a linear way. Um, part of what their brief was was to actually um, gain certain bits of information from them as well. So we had to kind of ask these questions. We were quite happy just doing something that they could move around in and experience. But um, unfortunately, um, businesses don't tend to work like that all the time. Um, so it was just the idea that you could move through a space within questions within that was kind of a bit of a, a sort of a fantasy kind of kind of world. But um, that, again, the whole idea of space. Um, it's just it just makes the whole thing a lot more a lot more enjoyable um, and I think as well it brings on um, a completely different life than if it, this was just flat design um, it's, 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 it's okay as flat design but um, if, it, if we'd just done it like this it wouldn't have any of the uh, I think the power that it actually has itself so again it flips itself around and you get to sort of, you know, some fairly, some fairly dry information in, in quite an interesting manner. Um, where are we? Okay. Um, one of the, um, again, kind of a, a, a bit of an experiment from our side of, uh, about sound. Um, and this was kind of one of the first things we did that was kind of about networking. Um, we um we just thought we, somebody asked us to just create a piece that was um to do with um community again um and we thought it'd be quite it'd be quite nice to just take on look at people are always sitting when they're bored i'm sure there's a load of people doing it now um sketching things for for no apparent reason we thought it'd be quite nice to just have um this little interface where you can put in six different points and you could add your name um submit your six points as it were um it could load it into sort of a sequence, as it were, um, and then you could play it. Now, what what this actually is is well, it's fairly obvious. Um, I've done this the last few times, but it's um, it's actually just a continuous line um, that connects different people's six points together, um, and all the sound is basically that we've got sort of six sounds which basically move dependent on where they've been placed in the, squ in the, in the square um, and they actually pan around in accordance to, to where people have put them to the next one. Um, I think this is actually still up. We, we put it up on a, on a website called Fake ID and I think it's still there. And last time I looked there was something like 125,000 different points on there. 
of people. So, I mean, this thing, it just runs and runs. And um, to me, again, I think it's quite nice just the fact that what you're actually looking at is the, the physical, well, the physical manifestation of, of, of connections between what different people have done. Um, and it's very simplistic, but it's, it's again, I think it's quite elegant um, in what it tries to do. And I think if you actually sort of hypothesize about it, it becomes really, it becomes really interesting because of what you could actually do with this. We, we talked about doing quite a lot of things with it, which was maybe, you know, connecting images and how can you sort of transform images into other things. So it's sort of, you know, how do, excuse me, how do different people's perceptions of each other sort of um, manifest in, in each other, etc. And, and it, but I think just, if it comes back, Um, I think just in that sense, it becomes um, becomes something that that I can sort of sit here strangely and, and look at for quite some time. But again, these are, these are kind of really small pieces that we do. You know, we spend I don't know, say three or four days just doing something like this, and then and just send it off to them. And I, that's the other thing that I really like as well is the fact that you can um, you can do these things in a very small amount of time. And uh, they can actually affect people for quite a long time, and people stumble across them um, a year later or whatever, and then they can email you about it. And uh, people just sort of end up emailing me um, about this the other day, and I was like, I'd totally forgotten, totally forgotten that we'd done it. Um, and it's quite interesting that you know things completely live on when when you're doing interactive work, um, and people can stumble across them quite easily. Um, I think that's why I'm still sort of really interested in the web. Like a lot of people, I think of. Um, Business-wise, have become very shrewd about the web. Like, what does it actually do? But in the sense of what people are trying to push it, people who are pushing what you can do with it, it's becoming a lot more interesting. There's a lot more kind of facilities for networking. There's a lot more facilities for sound. There's a lot more bandwidth. There's a lot of there's a lot more you can do um, than than when we were sort of messing around with this sort of because we sort of about a year and a half ago because we haven't really had time to do stuff like this. We've just kind of been working to a certain degree. Um, and it'd be quite nice to kind of revisit some stuff like this and uh, and see what we could actually do with it. So, this is um this this was a a networked installation that we did in three different spaces. Which was there was one in our front window in Hoxton Square, there was one in um, the ICA uh, when 1.0 was on, and there was it was showing in uh, the Lux, which is just on Hoxton Square. Um, and what we thought is that we, we we were talking about the idea of, of, of almost Chinese whispers, of the idea that if I say someone something to to a guy at work and then he goes to the pub and then he says it to some guy there and it, it's like guaranteed sort of ten ten people down the line. The story would be completely changed, or it won't, it won't be anything like what uh, what it was before. So we thought it'd be quite interesting to just do a piece of work based on that idea of um, send something, send send something a message, um, and then over a certain space of time, um, visually, it it kind of um, it gets degraded and it kind of gets sort of um, eroded to a certain degree as well, and, and changed into something else. Um, and what we've actually what actually happened was. Um, the three, we had three different computers for each space, um, and every time a message got written here, it actually physically moved on. When it when it wipes over, it moved on to the next one, um, and and gradually wore itself down. Um, there was two different interfaces for it, which was you could interact with it um, with your phone, so you could send it a message via your phone, or you could um, there was sort of terminals in each of the three places where you could either type it in or you could kind of draw. Um, icons. We made this little sort of drawing package, so you could just send sort of picture messages as well. Um, but just the idea of, of sort of this kind of dissemination of, of information, this sort of communication breakdown, um, I think it's quite an interesting um, sort of sense. It's quite an interesting subject as well, and also just the, the sense of having what what really was sort of three was one screen cut into three in three physical different places um, was definitely something that interested me as well. And it's like well. Do, uh, do people actually care about messages that are going on completely somewhere else, um, somewhere else in the world? Let's say, because I mean, it could obviously be anywhere. Uh, but it, again, it's quite um, 
it's it's kind of quite relaxing, for, I think, for something that's that's kind of so obviously digital. And because we the main interface for it was um, was phones, we we obviously sort of made it, gave it this kind of aesthetic of um, of just make, trying to make it look a bit a bit kind of like a phone. So um, this was called Public Pixel um, that we did about a year ago, I think. Uh, but again, you know, networking it's it's it, it's a thing that I think comes up even if things aren't actually actually connected via networks. Um, it's always good to try and bring on some sense of some sense of community within what you do and some sense of feedback. There was this function in a, within the MTV site where you could go and search for certain tunes. So if you like Bob Dylan and, and um, Britney Spears, you could type in them, and anybody who had the same sort of mu who'd chosen the same music um, could uh, you could email them and say, "Oh, hey, I'm really into your music choice," um, and then get them back. So you actually start a dialogue. Um, with complete strangers through the sort of the music choice th that you had, um, which again I think is is quite an interesting concept um, that you don't just have to connect people through directly. You can communicate and th get people communicating through through what their interests are. So. Um, this was um, a thing that we did um, called Blow Me, which was, um, we thought it'd be quite nice to uh, do a piece where the interactivity was, was basically blowing into it, which, um, and it was about how long you could blow. So the idea that um, you'd actually did something that, after you'd had a few beers, it really made you feel a bit sick and dizzy. Which was quite ni uh, quite an interesting thing, I think, in the sense of um, actually something like a piece of interactive design actually physically making you tired or feel a bit different. Um, I think is 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 quite interesting. There's another thing that we did ages ago, which I might show you, which was the same sort of idea. Um, <clears throat> but basically, we had this box that we built, and it had four straws that you could sort of replace that you blew into that were attached to um, a keyboard that we just sort of prized open and sort of wired up to um, these little um, kind of microphone sensors. Um, and what we actually did was, um, I'll, I'll show you the actual piece that we did, but basically this is just people sort of kind of using it. And we had this big projection um, that had uh, all these different um, animations that just appeared kind of randomly around the screen um, that were pretty much all to do with wind, obviously. Um, and uh, basically you kind of, you basically physically blew the illustrations kind of onto the page, um, which, was, which was on screen. So this is um, a few people few people blowing and uh, really disgusting actually when we opened the box up it was absolutely just covered in spit which was really really disgusting so we've um, nobody's actually we haven't used it again because someone's got to clean it but um, we did have some spare straws as well there for people who were worried about about the hygiene of our, of our punters but, um, if we're just going to So if you imagine, this is basically exactly what the projection was. Um, but um, every now and again, just these letters would just kind of randomly just move around. So you had that. But if, basically, if I was blowing now, you'd have this kind of stalk that could appear. Um, and the things were just sort of random. So as soon as you stopped blowing, it would just move back and disappear. So here you've got these kind of little kids with the kite. You've run off. This guy cycling down there. Um, really simple thing. I mean, the, the worst thing I always say about um, trying to show interactive pieces is that um, everybody should be actually trying it for themselves. Um, and it's kind of quite strange actually um, just showing them because the enjoyment really is in, in the kind of doing rather than the uh, rather than necessarily in, in necessarily what it looks like. But, um, the guy on the bike seems to be popular. Okay, so 
But I mean, you get the idea. I think just the idea that um, using different mo different ways to um, to interact with something is definitely kind of really interesting. Um, So, um, okay. This um, this is a piece that we did um, um, ages and ages ago. That was the first thing we did. That I would say is starting on the idea of physical interactivity. So, we've got this idea that you. You have to kind of wank the mouse, basically. So the more you move the mouse, the faster, the, the more the words spread. So if I, if I kind of do this for long enough, so anyway, you get the idea. I'm not going to carry on doing that. But um, I have done this in front of 3,000 people, which was really, really embarrassing. Um, but um, Again, it's, it's the whole idea of like, we've, we've got a computer. Let's, if we've just got a computer and we've got a mouse and we've got a keyboard, what can you make people do that's not too difficult? That um, A is probably quite funny, because after a while you totally forget that people are around and people get really intent on doing it, so we've shown it quite a lot, which is quite funny in itself, um, and, and letting people relax a bit and, and have some fun with interactivity. But it's also, we've got a terribly, terribly sort of dehumanizing thing with the computer, and anything you can do to make it a bit more physical or a bit more normal. Um, if you're doing something in retail, like how, how do people shop? Is it normal for them to touch a screen or would it, there be a better way of, of, um, of them interacting with that, which is something I'm, I'm going to get onto next. But um, I think the, the, just the whole element of having fun with things as well, especially if you're going to do some stuff for yourself. Um, I see loads and loads of really slick, really great sort of portfolios and things like that from, from people looking for work. and. Um, I, I, it just it doesn't interest me because if somebody gave me sort of a year and a half or two years to go and do some stuff for myself, um, I know I'd probably a bit more be a bit more proactive than I was at college at the time. But um, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to to be in education, I think, and to actually um, and to actually be able to learn to do a lot of this stuff and have some fun with it and be able to breathe with it. One of the things we're always asking our clients to do is is let us give us some time to breathe because they get a far better result out of out of us, um, which is usually the case that they, they hound you for things every couple of days or every day or sometimes every afternoon and morning. And uh, you, you just can't get anything done. And I think the best way I think that I've learned to, to deal with clients is to basically to, you know, to tell them to, to bugger off for a week or, or 10 days. Because you'll come back with something better because you'll actually get involved in what you're doing. And I think you'll care about it a hell of a lot more. Um, I'm gonna, one, of our, one of our big biggest clients is, um, is Habitat. Um, we, we built their sort of pan-European website in six languages for them, etc., etc. But we, um, we, we have a kind of retainer with them. So we can come up with ideas. We can look at their business sort of um, problems and try and come up with solutions for them. Um, and because, obviously, we're on a small retainer, it kind of pays for our time to, to mess around with things. So um, they had a store um, in Hamburg, which they... Um, they wanted to put some technology in too, um, and they just wanted some concepts for what um, for what they actually wanted to put in there. Unfortunately, this doesn't actually ever happen. But um, it's a classic thing with these things that sometimes you've just got to um, grin and bear it. But what we wanted to do is they um, they have a huge problem in Habitat that um, they do these sofas that um, you can get in. I think it's about 35 different fabrics, and no one ever ever buys them apart from white because that's the ones in the shop. Um, and obviously, because of space, you can't actually put 35 of the same sofa into the space. So um, they just couldn't figure out any, any kind of way of doing it in a, in a traditional sense. So we thought, um, we'd, this, these are just kind of basic layouts of, of what we thought like maybe the, the room could look like. So if I go to... Um, okay, so the idea was that... Um, we had kind of a room, and it could have been a plasma screen, or it could have been a projection, or, or whatever. Um, and you actually had the sofa there that you could that you could cut that you could change the um, change the material of. And what you actually had on there was different surfaces, 
um, and different kind of objects as well. So you could place them kind of together and have a look at what they look like. Um, I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with RFID tags. Um, what we did is just put, um, put the tag in into either we had fabric swatches or we had um, these kind of little, what we imagine is they were just kind of little models of, of what the pieces of furniture were. Um, and the interface was basically just this bowl. So all he did is just pick up, pick up what you liked, throw it in the bowl, pick up the fabric and throw that in the bowl. And because they were tagged, obviously it knew it was in the bowl. And magically, they appeared on the screen. Um, which probably, as we all know, isn't really magic. But the, the, we, we tried it out in a couple of stores. And people were absolutely amazed by it. But because they weren't faced with a screen and a keyboard that said, type in this, type in that, people actually sat down and started looking at it. It became like a social thing to do. Um, and obviously, when you're shopping, people just throw stuff everywhere. Nobody cares about it. So as an interface, it was actually really successful. The main problem with it is that you can steal everything. Um, it's, they went out for a, a couple of days, and after a while, there, there was just about three or four things left. So um, there's various problems with that. Obviously, you can't chain them down, because people don't really like picking things up like that. But um, as a concept, we, were, we started becoming really kind of intrigued with just the idea that um, so yeah this would be an idea of just you know what would happen when you came in there so you could you could change various things on the screen but the idea being that what you're actually doing is, is putting things into a bowl um, and we're still talking to Habitat about this they God, that's terrible. excuse me um, so yeah, it was, uh, we're still talking to Habitat about it, and we've still got some more ideas about how to use um, use technology in there. Um, and it's basically, you know, probably probably using RFID tags, which are you know the, the cheapest thing in the world, but you can do a hell of a lot of stuff with them. Um, and it's technology that everybody's got, and it's it's not that it's, it's always the sense of um, I, was, I was just kind of saying this before that um, it's not necessarily about how clever the technology is; it's what you actually do with it. Um, what we're actually trying to do here is solve a problem that, that a company have got. Um, and I think that's when technology, it's not technology becomes clever, but the, the technology help, helps your creative edge. Um, and there's a lot of people kind of doing this, but there's not a lot of people kind of trying to do this in the sense of trying to solve, solve problems like this. Um, I mean, I have a bit of a problem with helping people sell things, which is my own personal agenda, which unfortunately, because I work in a company, I have to leave some of my personal agenda at home. But um, it's, 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 a very, it's, it's, it's something that's going to happen. I know for a fact that within the next five years, everybody, um, retail or sm kind of small to large, is, is going to want some sense of physical, interactive something within their space. Um, and the reason I know this is because everybody wants us to do it, but they won't pay us for it at the minute. Um, because what they want to do is they want, they want you to prove that it's going to make them money. They're going to say, if we can pay you £100,000 for this, what is it going to get me? And with this, obviously, you know, we were kind of saying, well, it's going to get you sales like this. But um, in a sense of um, if we're going to do, if we're just going to install some kind of sensors that, um, that just change the color within the space and change the mood and change the, uh, and change the music without you actually kind of knowing about it in a kind of passive interactive sense, there's not a lot of people that are going to pay, for, pay you for it at the minute. But in the same sense that maybe five years ago, if I'd said every company in the world would have a website because it would be normal, people would have been like, I can't really imagine that. You know, five, say six years ago when I first started, trying to, the companies that had websites were software companies pretty much and a few entertainment companies who really put money behind it. And what, what's happening now is I think I can see exactly the same thing happening um, with the whole essence of interactive, uh, with physical interactive stuff. Um, in, in the next five years. So it's, it, it, it's going to be a massive, massive market. And there's also the whole other end, which you, you've, got, um, you've got museums and galleries, which are really getting on the back of this as well, um, which is something I'm going to come on to now. Um, I guess maybe one of, the, um, one of the most exciting projects that um, we uh, Okay. 
Um, we've been um, commissioned um, to. Okay, hopefully this is going to appear. Sorry, again. We've been commissioned by Jubilee Arts to um, do the interactive strategy for a new art gallery in um, West Bromwich. Um, the building is actually being designed and built by um, Allsops, who obviously you guys will know, the Peckham Library. Um, the, the interior is being done by Ben Kelly, who is possibly best known as doing the interior for the Hacienda. Um, Wolf Hollins are doing the kind of branding identity, um, and we're doing the interactive strategy for it. Um, I'll just explain kind of briefly about um, the, the idea of the building. Um, we've got some sort of very basic plans at the minute. I mean, the building hasn't actually been started to actually being made yet. They've just started digging, as far as I know. So it's quite, it's quite um, a unique opportunity to actually get in with the architects um, and with the interior designers and say, rather than coming at the end and them going, well, you've got a plasma screen over there. This is complete, a completely different kind of sensibility to it. Um, what we've actually got is um, a ramp, if we wait till the, uh, till the animation goes all the way around. What we've got is a ramp very much like uh, the Guggenheim in New York that goes up three sort of circular stairs. When you actually go into the building, um, you'll, you'll have to get in a lift and you go to the top of the building and then you walk down around these ramps. Now, as you go down around these ramps, um, what you'll actually encounter is certain different areas that we've sort of designated um, one of them is called the hilltop because it's basically just at a curve where, where it comes round. One part of it's like the river because the whole part tends to sort of flow and weave around a lot more than, than different bits. So there's going to be certain different pieces of work to suit the different kind of areas um, throughout it. So yeah, this is the idea of if you're just walking in the building. Um, and there's, as you walk down, there's, there's this thing that's called the sock, which is this sort of large bulbous sock-like thing. Um, on, uh, on the right-hand side of the, of the animation. Um, and within there, there's going to be three art galleries, of which are going to sort of hold um, slightly more traditional art, but all interactive. The whole, the whole space is going to be interactive art. Um, and what our job is, is to actually work out all the technical infrastructure within it. Like, literally, where, does the where do the computers go? Where do the sensors go? Where does this go? Where does that go? How is it actually all going to be networked together? Um, how much it's going to cost? Um, and how long it's going to take to put in. So in the sense of we've done five or six, well, maybe seven or eight different small jobs, um, we put together a really good pitch for this, and, and you know, they've gone for it. Um, and I mean, we pitched against IDEO for this, and IDEO are a huge company compared to us. You know, there's about three or 400 of them, and there's 20 of us. And there's only really about five or six of us who are doing this within the studio. Because what we actually did is actually pull together collaborators and people that we knew that were really impassioned about it, who were interested in it, who we know would do a good job. Um, and we know would give us something else, um, something new to put in there. Um, the, the thing that I really love about this project is that Jubilee Arts are a, a community arts project. They're not high art to a certain degree. They're not sort of, um, they're not Brit art. What they actually are is, um, they create stuff where the local people can actually come in, get involved, have workshops with things, create things, and then um, because of some of the things, some of the 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 exhibits we're going to put in there, their work will actually be on show and be actually get involved in the space. Um, and you know, to to me, that I think that's a really important thing. I do, the the whole essence of a lot of the clients that we work for, are, you know, sort of big names like Sony and MTV and etc. 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 Um, which is all fine because it, it kind of keeps you working, but there's not really much um, that you feel like you actually give back. There's a lot of stuff that I know that I can do, but I mean, does it actually help? Does it does it actually help that Sony can go and now sell some new products in a really great way? To me, this is far more important. The fact that hopefully some lo some local people will actually get to understand art um, and actually be involved in it. And I think the, the best thing about Jubilee Arts as well is that um, they're not just bothered about the fact of getting people to be involved in the process of art. What they actually want people to do is help create really good, oh, sorry, is actually get people to actually create good art, which is, I think, the main difference in, um, in what they're doing, um, definitely from our point of view, but you know, they're the longest running um, community, community arts projects 
um, I think, in England at the minute. So they've got a really good success rate. Um, and they also believe in what we're doing. And again, it's, you know, what I was saying before, this, this kind of job just wouldn't have happened in this country, you know, really, I don't think a couple of years ago. The fact that um, all of it is going to be interactive, I think, really makes um, a really big, it, it says quite a lot about people's attitude to it. Um, and as well, we're not just talking about technology. Interactive art could just be a painting on the wall that people can, you know, you can take off and actually handle it. You know, draw on or something like that. It's about actually making the stuff within a space accessible to people, I think. Um, and that's what really, I think that's what really um, excites me about this. But uh, I was saying before that because most of the stuff we do is, is uh, quite short, short, it's got a short time span. You know, a website might take maybe six months or it might take a couple of weeks. You know, th this has got um, a date of about 2005, I think, to finish, which is obviously quite intriguing for us because it gives us a couple of years work but it's also um, the sense that um, a completely different time scale and it actually lets you relax and think about it in a completely different way because usually we have to rush to think about these things and whereas with this we can uh, we actually have time to mull it over um, which I think is quite um, is quite important how am I doing for time anyone Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I'll show. We did. Um, there's the at the design museum. There's um. There's a thing called the tank outside. Um, okay, the Design Museum Tank was, um, they, they generally asked different artists and, and designers to, to put something in the tank, um, and that's pretty much the, the brief. So what we, um, what we decided to do was um, take it as a sort of a literal thing, as a tank, and um, think about how could we actually make it, um, give it some sort of digital, digital edge. Um, what we ended up, what we sort of thought was, it would be quite nice to, get a couple hundred mobile phones from somewhere um, and um, hang them as if it was kind of like a, um, a shoal of fish around. Um, what we could then do, we thought, is it'd be quite nice to um, have phone numbers. There were certain key phones within, um, within, within, within the tank. And as soon as you phoned it, what it would do is actually set off patterns of, obviously, light at different phones, but obviously sound as well. So what you'd actually get is kind of the idea, because the phones slightly vibrate as well. What you'd actually get at night is um, the idea of kind of a shoal of fish moving around to a certain degree um, in the dark. Um, and, you know, they, they went for it. Um, they've got really good um, partnership association with, uh, with Motorola. So Motorola gives, I think it was 120 phones, um, which we had to by hand program. Well, it ended up that we thought we could actually program it with their programmer's back end um, so that everything was done coded. But what we actually do is hand program all of the notes into the phones um, and actually work out which one was where and actually sort of, you know, do it, basically do it by hand, which was a real kind of pain because what it ended up as is it, um, the triggers weren't as, as quick as we'd like it. We'd, we thought it was going to be sort of like split second, but they actually sort of had to ring each other. So it was kind of, I don't know, like stoned fish, sort of, sort of kind of swimming around. But um, I think, you know, quite a lot of the time, it, 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 I mean, it looked absolutely fantastic at night. Um, it really was um, something that um, kind of visually definitely turned out. It didn't work as well as it should, but visually it really kind of ended up as something, I think there's some shots of it completely at night. So, you know, with the, um, it's in a really great setting, but some of the shots we actually got out of it was when they were actually kind of moving around, as you really got the sense of depth um, and kind of difference in between it. Um, and, you know, they're just, they're just phones hanging up. So I think, in that sense, again, it's, it's, it's okay, everybody's got a phone, but um, you can use that as an input device, but could you also use what's normally an input device as, as the output? Um, and it's kind of just the idea that you, can, you, can, you could swap things around, I think, I think is quite interesting. Um, and 
quite successful even when it doesn't work that well, um, which, is, uh, which is definitely a bonus. Um, obviously, we, we kind of set up, when we were doing this, we were testing it in the studio, but it's, we've got quite a large studio, but we haven't really got the space to sort of hang 120 phones, so we sort of had them lined up and they roughly did what we did, and it was literally the first time we put it in was the first time that we saw it, um, which hopefully isn't going to be the case with the, uh, with the Cplex project, but with this, I think it works fine. And again, these are, these are small investigations, I think, that um, we need to do for ourselves to find out what works and what doesn't, because it really gets you down to understand the brass tacks of what can you do with a phone and what can you do with what can you do with kind of working with their back-end programmers. So we, we actually know um, on Motorola's end what they can do with their phones as well, um, which, is, which is quite useful. So, um, I think as well, the thing with the tank was we got the opportunity to actually dress it as well. So we actually, you know, we've obviously got some people in the studio who, who are just more traditional graphic design um, who are interested in this, but they can't actually do it. Um, this brings us into the realm of um, we can involve a bit of exhibition design a um, bit of interior design, a bit of product design, a bit of programming, a bit of interactive design, and actually mold that together in different ways. Um, so it kind of uses small parts of everybody's kind of skills, which creates something a lot more. Rather than one person having to really slog it out, it means that we can spread the work between everybody, and it gives everybody a bit of freedom to have a bit of play with it, um, which is something that we've always tried to do with the studio. Um, if people are on kind of, you know, a pretty bad project for a... Uh, for a couple of months, we try and give them a decent project to do after that, and it's you know it's it's kind of you've got to sort of pay your dues a bit, but um, we try and get people to uh, to really help out, and you know most people stay quite late, and we we usually you know with these sort of things we have quite a good laugh with doing them, and I think it's very it's quite rare I think that um, a company, especially in the la you know the last couple of years, have been really tough, um, and a lot of companies have closed, and a lot of companies have stopped doing this sort of thing for themselves as well, um, and we just thought that. The, the key thing we should do is keep on doing this stuff because it's what it's what ke brought us to a certain extent in the studio altogether. Um, and the only thing that I think that was going to keep everybody there was uh, in the in the ultimate depression of, of everything going going wrong was was to keep doing this stuff ourselves. And again, you know, there's we've got work out of doing these sort of things. Um, especially now we've got a body of work that is interactive design, that's physical interactive design. Um, people are quite surprised at the, the amount that we've done and it's really just an accumulation of, of five or six small things that we've done and put ourselves at, you know, slightly out of our way um, to do and, and it's, it's, it's really paid off with you know, the CPLEX project um, up north so Um, I'm going to try and show you the tree, which, um, seeing as nothing is working on this computer, it may well not work, but let's try. The, um, the typographic tree was a piece of work that, okay, I'm going to, I'll, I'll show it at the end, I'll talk about it. The, um, typographic tree was, um, we were given the opportunity by the ICA to just put something in the theatre. And we had this idea of creating um, a digital garden. So um, after talking about it, we realized that trying to create the idea of a whole, basically like a park that was interactive as a whole installation was probably a bit too much work. So we, thought about, we, we tried to work out what our best idea was for the whole thing. We thought um, the idea of try, um, creating a tree from talking um, would be quite interesting. What we originally wanted to do is actually um, use uh, speech recognition so that the tree was actually built out of letters which was basically what you were saying um, and we spent about six weeks trying to train because um, you kind of I don't know if anybody's tried to do this but um, we actually tried to train it to understand words and after about six weeks we got about two people it could it could understand two people's voices in the studio um, and it, it could understand the word blue and silver so um, we didn't think that was particularly successful before we decided to go and do that. So what we thought is it'd be, just, it'd be a lot simpler to just do it from voice, from pitch um, and volume. Um, and the idea that what you, could, you could go in, different people could go in, we could design four different trees and you could actually talk. And while you were doing that, um, an actual tree would grow. Now, let's see.
hopefully. So there's the tree. And it's kind of working very slowly, but it's it's kind of working. Ah. So um, there's a couple of things in it, which is um, there's birds that fly down on it, and at certain points, if you if you shout at it enough, they fly away. Normally, this obviously runs a lot faster, but um, I don't know what's happened today. And we've got this system where every time it's up, when a tree's been created, um, it sends that tree to a website. So we've got this website on Digit Feed, which I don't know, it's got about eight or nine hundred trees on it or something now, which is trees that have been created when, uh, when, people have, when people have actually used it. And I think it's quite nice to actually have a record of, uh, of when something's been sort of put in place in an installation um, and how much it's been used and what sort of people have done, done what sort of thing. Um, and we quite like the idea that it's, it's, you can do quite a lot of things with speech recognition, but it's quite, a, it's quite an odd thing, um, I think, to actually maybe try and create a tree from it. But, um, but quite pleasant, wasn't it? actually works. So, so each one's got kind of strange nuances that this one's got flowers that explode that are kind of in this kind of style. Um, there's one that's just ink spots, which um, uh, the whole thing looks like it's been sort of drawn in kind of really rough ink, and then the ink spots just sort of drop down from it. Um, and there's one more that's just kind of like this, uh, it's kind of more like just completely real, so it's kind of like creating a real tree. But again, it's random, so I can't tell it when to uh, when to turn up. Um, I think, to be quite honest, at that point, I'm going to stop because my computer is just so dead. It's not really um, the ideal situation, which I generally apologise for. But um, if um, if anybody's ever interested in, in in what we're doing, then either you know check out. We've got um, a website called Digit Feed, which has got all of the physical interaction stuff that we're ever doing. Um, and if anybody ever, you know, is 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 got work and they really, you know, want to want to show what they're doing, because um, we're always looking at new stuff, new new things and projects to do like this. Obviously, with the um, the Cplex project, we're really interested in people who've got some new ideas for that, because we've got this space that we we're going to have to put in. I think it's about 35 new um, interactive exhibits, of which there's going to be budget for, um, and 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 time to do it, and it's going to be in. A fantastic new building, um, and it's going to be, you know, for the people, so to speak. Um, so, uh, yeah, if anybody's, you know, interested in, uh, in 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 getting involved in that and has has some work that they'd like like to look at, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I and we would love to see it. Um, and hopefully, my computer works when I get back to the office. Um, thanks. Oh, and if anybody's got any questions, then fire away.